Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tomcat Track on Tuesday, September 29th. Felix Schumacher is going to present Lost in the Docks, where he will look at some of the features that are overlooked or not found, but could be handy. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Well, my name is uh, Felix Schumacher, and I'm a uh, a member of the PMC of Tomcat and JMeter and a member of the ASF. And as Christopher said, this talk is about the documentation of Tomcat uh, or the lack of. Uh, it's about where to find documentation or where to find the documentation for interesting bits that are not necessarily easily found in the documentation. On the slides, uh, to get a bit more of my screen, I shortened the long package names Org Apache Tomcat or Org Apache Catalina to o.a.t or o.a.c, which you might find somewhere in the documentation too. So that's not too uncommon. So why would you be lost in the docs? There are many reasons. The first one is obviously that you're not reading the docs or not finding the docs. Then it could be that there are just too many pages of documentations or too many features. And of course, um, some say that the best documentation can be found in the source directly. So you might have looked at the wrong place or the documentation is in the wrong place, well, however you put it. So uh, I hope that after this talk, you will know how to read the docs, um, how to find it, where to expect to look at uh, the specifics. There may be in the user guide, in the reference, in the wiki, or as I said earlier, in the source. The first place uh, to look at is the Tomcat user guide, which I uh, placed here that URL for. When you're new, just start there. It's um, mainly um, a collection of small how-tos uh, around use cases you will find um, needed in the, when, when starting. The next one is the reference, which is handy if you know what you're looking for and suspect that uh, some documentation or some element has to be configured. You know the element, but you don't know the exact configuration option. Then go to the reference. It's on the same page, uh, starting page, but a bit more to the uh, bottom of the page. Then the wiki is um, community generated content. Everyone can edit it after registering on the wiki page. And um, that's mostly a bit broader than the documentation places uh, we've seen earlier, but it's uh, helpful and has a lot of information and you can make it better if you want to. The last place on the Tomcat page is the source. It's where you go when you know there is some feature, I had seen it, I don't know where, and you don't find it in the documentation earlier, look at the source and best would be to add the documentation for the features you found in the source only. And of course, there are other places. A handy search is, um, or a handy thing to do is to um, restrict your searches on the internet to special sites. For example, to the Tomcat Apache org site. If you're 
have stuck threads and want to have help, try Googling site column Tomcat Apache org stuck thread or use the mailing list. To use the mailing list, you have to be subscribed to the lists. There are a few different, or many different lists, not, not that many. And there is the users list and the developers list. And um, I suggest you start on the users list, ask your questions there. And if it's a problem with Tomcat itself and not with the usage of Tomcat, you will get directed to the developer's mailing list. Uh, for hard problems, it's generally really helpful to be subscribed to ask questions as there are real persons there who can answer questions, even if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. So after you now know where to look for the documentations, I've picked a few things that I found interesting in the docs or not really in the docs, but uh, interesting features of Tomcat that might be better documented. It's of course a subjective choice. Um, you might be interested in different things. The first thing that I find interesting is the parallel deployment feature where you can which you can use for um, high availability deployments. Um, with, so a deployment without interruption of your Tomcat running. Uh, Tomcat will remove old versions uh, for you if you configure it to, and it will route sessions that are existing to the correct versions of your app if you have really parallel deployed your app. That is mentioned in uh, the reference guide and the user guide. So you can look at both for more information. And um, to have a short overview, you name your war file with a hash hash version string dot war at the end. And um, be careful, it's really a string. So that look might look like it's a, a number, but it's a string. So it might be surprising if you use not the leading zeros and use one, two, three, four, ten, eleven. That's that might uh, then you might be in for a surprise. Um, another thing to look out is always for warnings in the lock on undeployment or redeployment, you might find that you hold onto your objects too tightly. Tomcat will probably warn you about this. So another thing that is really huge in Tomcat is uh, the number of system properties. They're all listed in the reference documentation and uh, can be used to fine tune Tomcat or to configure older behaviors of uh, Tomcat. You can configure those in the Catalina properties file found in Catalina home or Catalina base uh, more correctly conf Catalina properties. You can define them as usual system properties uh, via the Catalina opts uh, environment vari variable, which is handy in opposite to the Java opts environment variable you see sometimes mentioned as it is only used on startup, not for the shutdown version. The system properties are always set for the whole JVM, so you can't uh, use them to um, differentiate different properties for different web apps that are configured in the same Tomcat. And fun fact, you can configure the location of the Catalina properties file by specifying a property which named Catalina config. Then one really nice uh, feature is the property source, which I always have to look up again uh, by Googling uh, when I need it, if I haven't configured it already in 
my Tomcat instances. It um, can be used to replace a placeholder strings inside the files context XML, survey XML, web XML. It is mentioned in the Tomcat reference. And uh, we have a new feature, a property source that um, replaces environment variables. The standard or the default property source only uses system properties replacement. And I've seen that we can also use the property source to configure or to replace inside the system properties uh, the placeholders. So that might be fun too. How to use it? You use uh, the dollar bracket variable name or system property name, then a bracket close. Or if you want to define a default value, you can use colon dash. The db dot port in my example can be set by providing a Catalina opts value with dash capital D db dot port equals four two two three or whatever you want to place there. It doesn't have to be uh, inside the um, quotes. It, I, I believe it doesn't have to be inside the quotes. Don't quote me. So if the property sources that are available inside Tomcat's default installation, which is the system properties or the environment uh, replacer, you can provide your own property source. For that, you have to um, implement the property source interface and put the classes, the class or the classes inside the shared loader, common loader, class path, wherever you want to put it so that Tomcat, Tomcat can find it. I've usually put it into the Catalina base lib folder, which is the common loader, I believe. And um, after that, you have to define the property source system property to point to the fully qualified package name or class name of your implementation. One thing that comes up often, I think, on the mailing list is uh, people complaining about uh, Tomcat that their web application is uh, throwing null pointer exceptions or whatever, and that it's clearly the fault of Tomcat. And mostly, you can argue it is. Because of uh, the lo long history of Tomcat, the request response objects are not really recycled by the garbage collector, but by Tomcat itself, as it was considered to be really expensive to uh, give, the, give up on objects. They were recycled. And um, the thing is that the servlet specification has life cycles you have to be sure about. Or, and uh, you should not, or you must not, hold on to the request or response objects longer than the re request life cycle. If you do, you're in trouble, especially on Tomcat in the default configuration. And that's when you get the null pointer exception. So if you um, have such problems, you can configure Tomcat to recycle the facades to, to give them, to give the um, request response objects back to the garbage collector. It is mentioned in the Tomcat reference and I have the feeling that it's coming up a lot on the mailing lists. So another feature which is not that commonly known, I believe, is the virtual hosts support of Tomcat. I believe it is because mostly um, the default setup, which you find a lot documented on uh, the internet is we have an Nginx or um, 
an HTTPD in front of Tomcat, and those are used for the virtual hosts and not Tomcat. But you can use Tomcat to um, serve virtual hosts. And there's another handy feature that you can configure the defaults for the different virtual hosts. Um, so the first part, you have to add another host. Tomcat comes default installed with one default virtual host, which is named localhost, which has nothing to do with a network name localhost. It's just the name of the default host in the engine. And uh, when Tomcat can't find a special host for your um, virtual host name, for your DNS name that you wanted to talk to, it will look up the default host, which happens to be localhost. So, but in our case, we want to add another one named customer one, and we want to have a special um, directory to place our web apps for that virtual host. So we configured host, named it customer one. That should be the name of the DNS name you want to talk to. So customer one is probably a bit short. You probably have a bit longer name there. You can use everything from the documentation in the reference documentation, look up the host. And we add um, a folder for the customer one and we add um, a folder for the web apps. Then inside the folder for the customer one in Catalina base conf Catalina customer one, we can place um, the two files web.xml.default or context.xml.default where we can override some stuff that is normally found under conf Catalina, uh, not on, on, directly under conf. And uh, the order of the lookup is first uh, we look at the context files that come with a web app. There are many places where the, those can be. Um, and the second part is our virtual host config file, the web XML default or contact XML default. And last, if nothing is found there, Tomcat will look into the conf Catalina, uh, conf default or uh, conf context.xml or conf web XML. Um, yeah, it's quite handy and documented in the reference guide and in the user's guide, uh, the virtual hosting, how to, or if you know, especially uh, if you know really what to look for, look at the context file. So now to something that is available source code documentation only. Well, okay, it's in the wiki too. It's about Kubernetes uh, support of Tomcat. Uh, I believe John Frederick will have a session on that later. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. And um, why do we have a special cluster setup for Kubernetes? It's because of the way Tomcat tries to find cluster members. The default uses multicast and multicast is not really good for Kubernetes. So we have to provide um, a membership class or a membership provider to Tomcat. And that can be done by giving a membership uh, element to the channel and that will set up Tomcat inside a Kubernetes cluster. Well, there is probably a lot more to it. John Frederick has a complete session on it. The slides from an older session can be found on SlideShare. And uh, John Frederick has a GitHub account where he has a bit of documentation on it. And the wiki can be handy too. So now what I find is mostly not that well documented is uh, the usage of valves or the, the plentitude of valves that Tomcat provides. 
and I've um, picked three different valves that I find interesting and that are not in my nearer, um, yeah, in my environment is, is, are not that well known. So the first one, the stuck thread detection valve, can be used to um, point you to a problematic servlet requests that take too long. Whenever Tomcat um, finds that a servlet request is taking too long and you've configured the stuck thread detection valve, it will lock or it can, can be configured to lock the place of the servlets that are problematic and uh, those information can be um, read through JMX if you want to. The valve can be configured to um, interrupt the stuck thread, but um, don't hold your breath. Many problems will be not solved by interrupting them. Um, but it is a first pointer the logging can lead you to the place where you have to look at if you have problems with stuck threads or with Tomcat hanging up and you don't know where to look. Another nice thing is the semaphore valve, which you can use if you have parts of your application which you know are problematic if there's too much concurrency going on. Then you can configure the semaphore valve and it will guard that place. Um, and it can be used to redirect uh, requests that are coming in when you have reached your desired or configured state of concurrency so that uh, the user will get a nice page of, for errors or maintenance or explanations and not have to wait and um, you don't overload your application. The semaphore wealth can be used and overwritten the control currency, concurrency method, so that you have more control of your maximum concurrency or what you count for concurrency. The last example for valves is the rewrite valve which mimics Apache HTTPD rewrite module. It is not that capable as uh, its bigger brother, but it comes quite handy if you have a simple redirect or a bit of extraction of parameters um, in the request URL. It can be configured by the rewrite config and I believe it is documented in the reference only. Um, for all those valves, you have to be aware that if you use the newer async features of the servlet spec, you might run into trouble because those valves are mostly a bit older and um, think that servlet requests should be synchronous. You might be lucky, a rewrite valve will probably work just fine, but I think the, um, the, the, the other valves might give you more trouble. So the another reason I stated in the beginning why you were lost in the docs were probably too many features. Tomcat comes with two different implementations of a JDBC pool, of a database pool. And uh, you might not know which one to use. There's the JDBC pool and the Tomcat DBCP uh, pool. And I think it's um, a bit of a historical problem. The old Tomcat DBCP pro pool was based on DBCP1 and had a few problems with uh, concurrency with the deadlocks, with the missing features. And um, some members of the Tomcat 
community decided we have to do something about it, let's invent our own pool, the JDBC pool, which fixed the problems of the old DBCP pool and is quite capable, but um, was never that well received inside the community as I have seen it. Plus the DBCP community um, brought out the DBCP2, which fixed all the problems with their old implementation and was quite easily replaced inside the Tomcat DBCP pool, which is basically a rebranding of the DBCP2 uh, stuff. Uh, the documentation of our Tomcat DBCP pool references you write to the DBCP2 reference documentation. So it's really the same. And um, the JDBC pool development has basically stalled. If there is a bug in it, it might get fixed, but new features will probably not be there. So if you decide now which one to use, I recommend the Tomcat DBCP pool. If you have a JDBC pool, which works fine for you, stay on it or look if the new, the other one might work for you too. So another one uh, uh, documentation in the source only is probably the running.txt in the root directory of a fresh Tomcat installation or in the source code itself. It shows you how to set up a multi uh, instance setup. And I believe that Christopher Schultz has a whole session on it. So if you want to know more about it, then I am ready to explain now, head over in time to his sessions. The one thing that I find interesting inside the uh, running txt is the mention of the setenv.sh or .bat file which can be used to customize environment settings for Tomcat. There's no need to edit Catalina.sh or, or startup shell files. The setenv files are sourced into the environment that is run inside of Catalina or startup. It will make updates a lot easier if you have not meddled with the Catalina or startup file. So the another thing with instant setup, as said, Christopher will probably tell you a lot more than me. For me, it's interesting to see that there are two different environment variables, Catalina Home and Catalina Base, which point to the same directory in the standard installation, but can be used to um, enable multi-instance setup. The Catalina Home file, uh, environment variable will point to the installation folder where you extracted the binaries you downloaded from the Apache page. And Catalina Base will point to the place where you have your web apps, your configurations. And if you want to set up it really fast, you can extract a Tomcat. I've used the current Tomcat 9038 placed it under surf Tomcat and um, configured my Catalina base to point to a TC instance directory, which contains a bin, a logs, a web app stamp, a work order, a folder. And my path is always to copy the configuration folder conf from the installation directory which might get out of date when I update. So be sure to look for differences uh, when you update. Then I configure my Catalina home uh, environment variable to point to the Catalina, uh, to, the install, to the install directory and the Catalina base to point to my, uh, to my setup with a, my logs, my web apps, my time folders. And then I start up Tomcat by calling the bin startup file from Catalina home. The resource framework 
is probably not that well known and probably a bit exotic, but can be con can come quite handy if you have special use cases. Basically, every file Tomcat reads from Tomcat 8 up, uh, 8.5 and up um, is through the resource framework. So classes, jar, static resources, all are routed through the resource framework. For older versions of Tomcat 7 or I believe 8.0, there were similar concepts called virtual div context or virtual web app class loader, which are removed and you should uh, look at the resource framework now. You configure those in the context of your web app in a resources tag. This example has a pre-resources um, configured, which is basically used to mount something before the resources that come with your web app. So here I have um, configured a special config jar, which you could use for customer one in my previous example, um, which has another image inside or CSS files, which uh, could be uh, served from the config special config jar, which is mounted here as a jar resource set, which means all the files inside the special config jar will be visible inside the web app mount, which is web in classes um, and will be found before other web in classes, which might be found in the web app or in the war file. So you have different types of resource sets you could use. The web resource set is really an interface which you could implement yourself. Uh, might be handy if you want to serve stuff from a database or from someplace, I don't know. And the three default ones pre-installed are the dir resource set, the file resource set, and the jar resource set. The dir resource set is um, used to mount a complete directory as a directory inside of uh, your class loader, I, I suspect. The file resource set is for just one file and the jar resource set we've seen earlier is uh, files inside the jar will be mounted as files inside the mount point. The resource ordering is uh, from the pre-resources first that we saw earlier and the post resources last. And I think that the most common ways to overload are the pre-resources if you want to set your uh, customization and the post resources to set some default values for web applications that might be missing those. So, and with that, um, I'm through to, with my slides. Um, any questions? Uh, uh, Sublet filters do anything special? Uh, Sublet filters do not have to do anything special when they are programmed correctly to the surflet spec and use the surflet life cycles. Problems uh, come to life when you hold on to the request response objects for too long. That's mostly a misunderstanding of the surflet spec, which I start with two. I placed a surflet, a request object inside the class variable or an instance variable and uh, uh, was surprised that my application didn't work at all. And uh, that would or might have helped with the facade, but uh, the, the, rec uh, the recycling, but um, I, I, sh I have fixed my application. Um, 
I, I will share my slides. Um, I will upload it to the place I was told to. And I believe that uh, Christopher will have many more commands to um, for the um, application. I, I can go back to the slide yeah, for the multi-instance setup if you want to use it. It's, I believe, uh, documented good in the running.txt, but the running.txt might be a bit difficult to find. All right, are there any further questions for Felix? All right, if you would like to continue on the Tomcat track, will be Andrew Carr, who will be speaking about deploying production instances. We'd love to have you join us for that in a few minutes. Thank you very much, Felix. Yeah, thanks for having me and see you later.